Hello, welcome everybody. It's Pastor Mark here at East Brady Baptist Church. So delighted to be here with you for online worship for the week of November 6, 2022. Glad that you could join us. Let's start today with our call to worship, which is this week adapted from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. Blessed is he whose help is in the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The Lord reigns forever. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you as your children to give you the honor and praise that you so richly deserve. You are our one and only true God, the generous giver of life and the sustainer of our souls. We are grateful for your grace, for how you love us, for how you have called us to be your hands and feet. In response to your great mercy, we confess how we have sinned and fallen short of the people you created us to be. We have acted in selfish ways. We've, we've hurt one another. We've functioned as if the universe revolves around us. We have strayed from our worship of you and gone our own way. We are heartily sorry. Please forgive us, Lord, and cause us to truly repent and to be mercifully receiving of your love. We pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for announcements today, just want to remind you, uh, we have Bible study uh, coming up here this Thursday, at November 10th at 10 a.m. Now we have that at the high rise. It's for the whole community, for everyone to come in, just come into the main uh, social area there. And there we are. That's uh, 10 a.m. this Thursday, November 10th. Bible study. We are still in the book of Revelation. Uh, lots of stuff to be uh, looked at there. So if you want to join us, please do so this Thursday. Uh, as you see here behind me, we are in the midst of our Operation Christmas Child uh, Drive, which is uh, a mission we participate in every year where we fill these shoe boxes with gifts uh, that are then sent to children who need them all over the world as a way of showing them, hey, there are people out there who love you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus loves you too. So we are doing that. Uh, they, they always need more boxes. So if you would like to pack a box uh, and, and do that with us, we would encourage you to participate in with that, that with us. Bring it here and put with our stack of boxes here. Uh, we are collecting uh, until uh, Sunday, November 13th. That's next Sunday. That's our cutoff date. So get your boxes and, and get them to us. If you want more information about this ministry, what you should put in a box, what really happens, what you do, uh, you can go to www.samaritanspurse.org and find information there. You can use any shoebox. Any shoebox you've got can be used. We've got pre-printed shoeboxes here. If you want to grab some from us, stop by someday. We'll give you some and fill them up with gift-filled uh, things for children all over the world. Again, our, our cutoff date for that is November 13th. Uh, we're getting ready here. It's hard to believe, but later in the month is Thanksgiving. So our church Thanksgiving dinner, our church family Thanksgiving dinner will be Thursday, November 17th, one full week before Thanksgiving at 6 p.m. So if you would like to, to come to that, please let us know. You, you need a reservation. You, you don't have to pay anything. It's just a reservation so we know how many people to plan for. It's, it's an Italian dinner because everyone has turkey and stuffing with their own families on Thanksgiving. So we do something a little bit different as a church families. We'll have lasagna, salad, and, and garlic bread, and, and, and uh, sweet potatoes, and, and pumpkin pie, and apple pie, and all sorts of good things. So that, that's, again, 6 p.m. Thursday, November 7th. 17th. If you would like to attend that, uh, please let us know at the church so we can expect you. And just coming up, hey then, uh, Sunday, November 20th, two Sundays from today, uh, after worship, we're going to be decorating the sanctuary for Christmas. Uh, so hey, if you're there, won't you please join us for that? A pizza, pizza lunch will be provided and then we'll get to work uh, making things look beautiful for the, the Christmas season here. Uh, other than that, just a regular announcement that if, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, won't you use the comment section to let us know that you're with us, let us know that you're here, let us know how you're doing, because uh, we'd love to hear from you. And also, you can use those comments to leave prayer requests. Uh, everyone will see those requests, and we will pray together as a community of believers for you. We turn now to our time of teaching. We are still in the book of 2 Peter. So in a moment, I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 17. So if you've got a Bible or an electronic device in which you read your, your scriptures, won't you open it up then to 2 Peter chapter 2? 
as always. We'll put the words from the scripture up on the screen for you here. At 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, These people are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Well, I found online this week the following firsthand account written by a man named Nicholas. Nicholas writes, I believe I've genuinely lost my salvation. At the age of 20, I took the altar call, went in front of my church, announced my belief in Christ, and was baptized. About 15 years later, I became fearful that I was neither hot nor cold, but was lukewarm. It is here that I believe I made a fatal mistake. I decided that I'd be better off cold than lukewarm, as I was afraid I didn't have what it took to be hot. So in my foolishness, I renounced my faith in Christ. I began to testify that Christ was a myth and that Christianity was a falsehood. Words written by Nicholas. Nicholas, who now, if you read his words, he's interested in following Jesus again. But he wrote, he's terrified. Had he lost his salvation by renouncing Christ earlier in his life? Which begs the greater question that many ask. Can salvation be lost if one acknowledges Christ and then turns their back on him later? Can I lose my salvation? Or does the oft-quoted axiom, once saved, always saved, does that hold up? And if it holds up, then what does that mean for those who claim Christ and then later in life denounce him? How can they really turn their backs on Christ if they are truly saved? Lots of questions. The question of whether we can lose our salvation is a big one among believers, as is evidenced by another online user who wrote, I am always afraid I will lose my salvation. I can't become perfect. I just can't. And because of this, I'm afraid of losing my salvation. This is a big problem because I can't live a normal life anymore. I've turned into an anxious person who is depressed. People around me have noticed and started asking me, what's happened? How do I deal with it? Big questions, right? Or consider this. I know someone personally who grew up in the church, was very much engaged in the Christian lifestyle, was baptized as a believer, and proclaimed Jesus as their Savior, was very active in different ministries within the church, but later in life has decided that they don't truly believe any of it now. There are too many questions in their own head about God. And so they, no long, they claim they no longer have faith. Now, is that person still saved? Were they ever saved? <laughs> you see, as we've been looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, and we've been looking at Peter's warning to the church about false teachers, I have intentionally waited to address the final few verses of the chapter until now, because they seem to wade into the waters of this theological issue. Can you lose your salvation? And I didn't want to just gloss over that, because we were just looking at the bigger topic of false teachers. So I waited. So today we use what Peter wrote there as a jumping off point for this discussion of whether someone can lose their salvation. Because with just a quick read of verses 20 through 22 of today's passage in 2 Peter 2, it would have seen that Peter is teaching that, yes, you can lose your salvation. You can come to faith in Christ, and then you can uh, leave him and lose your salvation. As a reminder, listen again to what Peter wrote there. He wrote, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. 
It would have been better off for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on this sacred command that was passed on to them. That's 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Peter seems to be indicated that there, there were people who, who knew Jesus, but then they, they get entangled in the world and its enticement to sin, and so then they turn their backs on the sacred. And so it may seem, he writes, that they were worse off in this second lostness than they were before even knowing Jesus. A surface-level reading of this passage does seem to say that these people had faith in Christ and then they lost their faith. And so it would have been better for them to have never known Jesus at all. Everybody, that's not what Peter is writing. That's not what he's saying here. I know that because that doesn't make sense in light of other scripture. Now, one of the truths of effective Bible study is that scripture must be interpreted within the context of other scriptures. So if I got this scripture here that I says that I, I, I think says this and this, but I've got all these other scriptures here that say the opposite. That means this one, I'm interpreting this one incorrectly. Specifically, difficult or unclear passages such as this one in 2 Peter chapter 2 must be interpreted in the context of passages of Scripture that are very clear in what they are teaching. And other passages of Scripture indicate clearly that once you are saved by Jesus, you cannot lose that salvation. In other words, yes, indeed, once saved, always saved. So let's look at some of these other scriptures that tell us that clearly, so then we can come back and look at what Peter is writing in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, and we can figure out what these confusing verses must actually mean. There are several go-to scriptures that teach about eternal security, once saved, always saved. There are many scriptures that kind of talk about it and support it, but some of them, they're just those go-to ones that are so clear that, that you look at first. One of the big ones is in Romans chapter 8, where in verses 29 and 30, the apostle Paul writes, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among the many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now, on the surface, that can be a very intimidating pair of verses, can it? I mean, it's very theological sounding and it throws out scary terms like foreknew and predestined and justified and, oh, it's frightening, but don't be scared of it. It it actually breaks down nicely for us when you look at it closely and you take your time. Simply put, it's saying, hey, God, in his foreknowledge, he knew everything in advance. So he predestined, he predetermined that some would be saved by becoming righteous like his son, Jesus Christ, through faith. So God called those predestined to salvation, he called them to saving faith in Jesus. He said, hey, believe. And so then by their faith in Jesus, then when they respond to God's call... The predestined are justified. That means they are made right with God by the forgiveness of sins, by Christ's sacrifice on their behalf on the cross. And so Peter or Paul concludes that they are eternally glorified with God. Now, as we apply this to our study of once saved, always saved, let's first look at, at, at the one doing all the acting in this passage that describes how we are saved unto eternal glory. Who's the one doing all the acting? It's God. God does it all. It's not us. Our salvation is not up to us at all. God does it all. Therefore, since it's not up to us, we cannot do anything to lose it because we didn't do anything to earn it. It's God all the way. That's how great he is. But beyond that, let's look at what it says uh, at the end. It says uh, God predestined some, so he called them and he justified them and he glorified them. Let's look at what it says about God glorifying those he calls to be saved. See, in the original language, the glorification is stated as something already consummated, though still future in the fullest sense, it's already done, meaning the eternal glory of the saved is both complete and certain in God's sight. You might put it like this, those who will be saved, God predestines them to come to saving faith in Christ so that when they do, when they answer God's call to be justified, to be saved, they come in faith. Their eternal glory is a done deal. So far as God is concerned, it's already done. So that means you can't fall out of it. 
because you've already been glorified. So you can't be saved and eternally glorified and later not eternally glorified because eternity is eternity. Either you are eternally one thing or you're eternally another thing. But you can't change from one eternal thing and later you're no longer that eternal thing because it's eternity, right? See, when you come to God in saving faith, you are saved forever. It's like my niece, Jane. My niece, Jane, she turned 15 this past week. Praise God, I mean, because from a worldly perspective, you know, she wasn't supposed to live to her second birthday. She turned 15, this wonderful young lady, a uh, healthy young lady uh, now. But uh, let's say somehow I've just got lots of money laying around. I've just got all this cash sitting around. I've got to do something with it, right? So to prepare for next year, when she turns 16, I go and buy Jane a brand new car. And I get the title put in her name, and I pay for it fully in cash. It's hers. Now, Jaina doesn't know how to drive. Jaina isn't licensed to drive. Jaina isn't old enough to be licensed to drive. But that car is hers. Even though she's not driving it, it's hers. It's a done deal. See, our salvation in Christ is like that. Even when we aren't living into that salvation, it's a done deal for us. When we come to faith in Christ, our eternal glory is sealed forever. Now, the total fulfillment of that may be in the future when we are fully glorified with Christ in heaven. But even so, right now, it's complete. It's certain. It's done. When you come into that by faith in Christ, you can't lose that. It's a done deal. Jesus indicates as much when he's teaching in John chapter 10. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. That's John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. Jesus says that his sheep, the saved ones, they are given to him by his father in heaven. And he says the father is greater than all. Sometimes we forget that. We kind of limit God to make him human and, you know, limited. But God's greater than all. So God the Father is is so great that no one can snatch those who are given to Jesus in faith from his hand. That's how great God is. No one can do it. That means in the moment when you come to faith in Jesus, you are forever secured in his hand. You are forever secure with Jesus. You are saved forever. He says, no one can snatch you from my hand. Now, some read this and they say, yeah, no one can snatch you from Jesus' hand, but you can remove yourself from Jesus' hand. You can walk away from faith and therefore you can walk away from Jesus. But remember, the saving work is of God. See, when you come to God in saving faith, God places you in Jesus' hand. And no matter how wonderful, how fabulous you might be, you can't undo what God has done. That means even you cannot snatch yourself out of Jesus' grasp. That's as silly an idea as, hey, if you're holding a handful of paper clips, right? And one of the paper clips of its own free will just starts jumping up and down and jumps right out of your hand. That's absurd because that doesn't happen. Now, you may be holding a handful of paper clips and you, you may drop one or two. But the great thing about it is Jesus never drops you. You're secure in his hand. Jesus, instead of dropping you, he, he declares in John chapter 5, Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. When you hear and you believe the gospel, when you come to God in faith, you cross over from death to life, to eternal life. So here's the thing about eternal life and, and resurrection, right? One day when Jesus returns, there will be a physical resurrection. Your body will be reconstituted in the ground and you will rise to eternal life physically. But the spiritual resurrection happens at the moment of faith. You cross over from the death, the death, eternal death, the death caused by sin. And you enter into eternal life in Christ. That's not a future thing. That's something if you've put your faith in Christ, you've already done. Your resurrection is at once a future thing and an immediate thing. So you cannot cross from death to life and then back again. You cannot be resurrected and then later unresurrected. 
Imagine that. It's just like, just imagine with me. You know, or first, imagine being resurrected, right? You're physically resurrected, right? You come up out of the ground, if your body fully reconstituted, and this resurrected body, you look great. You look better than you've ever looked, man. You're looking fine. And you walk around, and, and you joyfully see all the people you love and that you've missed, and you hug them, and you embrace them. You're having a good time. But then, well, hmm, that gets old quickly. You decide you no longer want to be resurrected. So you, you, what, you go back to the cemetery, you, you, you dig a hole, you cover yourself with some dirt, and, and you wait for your body to decompose again? You're going to unresurrect yourself? I mean, that, that's absurd. See, once you cross from death to life in Christ through faith, you are alive. You're alive forever. So the scriptures are very clear. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You cannot lose your salvation by backsliding or falling into sin. Now, backsliding... Falling to sin for a believer in Jesus Christ, that's serious business. And that's why the scriptures are full of warnings and urgings, urgings for us to, to persevere in our faith and in our salvation. Right? So we don't miss out on, on the benefits uh, of living in that saved life. But those who are truly saved, those who have an authentic faith and they backslide, they will be brought back out of their backsliding and back into righteous living for Christ whether by the Holy Spirit working in their lives, whether it's by other people of faith coming and helping them come back out of it. Usually it's both. It's both. The Holy Spirit works through other people to help you, right? So there's that. But at the same time, Pastor J.D. Greer does point out, you know I love J.D. Greer, right? Great theologian, great preacher. But he points out there are unsaved people who for a while look like saved people. See, they were part of the church. Maybe they were born in the church. They grew up in the church. They may have been baptized. They attended Sunday school every week, maybe for years. They did all the church things, were in all the ministries. They may have even been out there excitedly telling other people about Jesus. But then at some point in their life, they come to the conclusion that they don't believe in Jesus and they deny him and they deny the faith. Now, perhaps when, when we talk to somebody who might fit this description and, and they grew up in church and said they believed and now they're saying they don't believe, maybe they are just backslidden, right? They've fallen in their own pattern and their faith will eventually reassert itself and will pull them back out of that denial, back in, into righteousness. But maybe, maybe the sad truth is that they never had an authentic saving faith to begin with. They haven't lost faith in salvation because they never had it. Now, it seems they had faith in something, they had faith in church and, 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 and church living, they had faith in religion, they had faith in whatever. But it wasn't an authentic saving faith in Christ because saving faith is faith that endures. I'm indebted to Pastor J.D. Greer for so many of the ideas I'm talking about in this sermon. But Pastor J.D. put it like this, only a faith that endures to the end is proof of real saving faith. How do I know if I have saving faith? Well, it's going to endure through to the end. If it doesn't endure to the end, it wasn't true saving faith. Saving faith is faith that endures. There are many who we in the church we see as falling away from faith. But the truth is they were never saved to begin with. So with that clearly established here, how then do we interpret what is written for us in 2 Peter chapter 2? Well, it's important to remember that in this context, Peter is talking about false teachers, right? These are people who are teaching a false Christ. There's something other than the true saving Jesus. So they may have heard about the real Jesus, but they've changed it into something else that fits them better. So we already know that they are false. They, they are not true believers. They don't have authentic saving faith. They're false. But they had come from within the church. And meaning that for a while they had escaped the corruption of the world by being part of the community of believers that actually knew Jesus as Savior of the world. See, they had been on the inside with those people. They had been on the inside of proclaiming and living a life out of the truth of Jesus Christ. They saw it up close and they lived in its joy with those who actually did believe. And yet in order to pursue their own desires, their own sinful yearnings, their own idea of how things should be, 
and they rejected it. See, they're, they're again entangled in the world and its sin. So Peter writes, now they're worse off because it was right there for them. God couldn't have put it any closer. They were amidst it all. And yet they left it. So it would have been better for them never to have known God's righteous command to come to him in faith. See, they had heard it. They knew it. They lived like it. And ultimately they rejected it. They never came in true, authentic faith. And so as a dog returns to its vomit, or as a pig that's been washed, it's been experienced what it's like to be clean, and yet it returns to wallowing in mud. That's what they're like. They return to their sin and embrace it rather than life in Christ that they had seen up close. See, they may have looked like saved people for a while, but ultimately we can know they were not because saving faith is faith that endures. So what do we do with this today? Well, for most of us hearing this message, we, we celebrate because we, this, this reassures us, right? Our salvation, it's certain. It's complete. We know it cannot be stripped from us. We know we can't mess up so much that God just takes it away. We know that when we endure in faith, even when we slip and sin, Jesus continues to hold us firmly in his grasp. We can be joyful and we can be at rest in that truth. Or, if you happen to see in yourself, as I'm talking here today, a lack of faith. Perhaps you once lived as a believer, but have since concluded that you don't really believe. Maybe you've never even really told anybody that. Well, one of two things. One, you are a saved person that's in a place of serious backsliding into sin. And so that true saving faith within you is working right now through this message to call you back to live for Christ. Leave your sin today and live in the righteousness of Christ who saved you. Or two, maybe it is true that you were never truly saved. You haven't lost your salvation because you never had it. You never had true faith. Well, the good news for that is it's never too late, right? Today is the day the Holy Spirit of God calls you to repent of your sin and to follow after Jesus in true saving faith. Won't you do that today? And then you go on living in that enduring faith that saves for the rest of your life. It's never too late. So for us all, this is a call to faith in Christ, to be saved and to follow Jesus. See, once saved, always saved. Once saved, forever following. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, for giving us salvation in Him. God, for, for predestining us to, to know Him, to, uh, for calling us to faith, for justifying us through that faith, by what Jesus did for us on the cross, and then uh, by giving us the promise of eternal glory, which we have starting now. It's not just some future thing. Thank you, God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you that you always are there to reassure us. God, right now, I, I pray for two different types of people. I, I pray for the person who maybe does have saving faith, but is backslidden into sin, and, and maybe they've just kind of uh, forgotten about Jesus for a while and aren't really living for him and aren't really living according to the way he, he has taught us to live. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit just uh, goes to work in them uh, and just empowers that faith that is deep within them to come back out and to retransform their lives for Jesus Christ, that they would come back to walking the path that Jesus has set before them when they came to him in faith. But God, I pray also for that person who may maybe has never had an authentic faith. Maybe they've been in, involved in ministry and in church before and in religion before, but maybe there was never any true faith, no true relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you help them to see that. And I pray now that you help them, God, to leave themselves behind, leave their own selfish desires behind, leave behind their own ideas of what should be. And may they come to you in faith and faith, faith that endures, and therefore it's faith that saves in Jesus Christ, that they, with all the believers, would be glorified with you in heaven forever. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, another one of our online worship services. Uh, in a moment, we're going to conclude with a Thanksgiving hymn. And it's that time of year where we start singing hymns that are associated with the Thanksgiving holiday. So we'll sing together, we gather together. But first, won't you receive the blessing? May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.